there's a lot of abbreviations in cycling. So I thought that I'd compiled the most commonly used ones here and handily I'm going to bookmark them all so that you can come back to them again and again for when you forget what they mean, like I do all the time. So let's get started with probably the most common one that you'll come across, especially if you're new to cycling, and that's FTP. FTP stands for Functional Threshold Power. Functional threshold power is the maximum average power in watts that a cyclist can maintain for about an hour. It's a key metric because lots of other measurements come off knowing what your functional threshold power is, such as being able to set your power zones. We'll talk about power zones in a minute, but let's stick with FTP for now. You will see that there's some FTP tests within Zwift and these are usually around 20 minutes and they are quite often used to set as a benchmark over that 20 minutes to then calculate what your functional threshold power is. Now there are two other acronyms within Zwift and within cycling that are linked to FTP and those are EFTP and ZFTP. EFTP is an estimated functional threshold power and you'll find this in some apps that basically use the data that you've provided with the rides that you've done and estimate the FTP for you. So intervals.icu is one of these and other apps use this methodology as well. So without actually having to do an FTP test they will estimate where your FTP is. So that's quite useful if you don't want to do an FTP test because they are particularly brutal. So ZFTP is Zwift's version of EFTP, Estimated Functional Threshold Power. They use their own algorithms within the game to estimate what your ZFTP is. And this is then used in certain racing environments such as the Zwift Racing League. Unlike a traditional FTP test, Zwift uses an algorithm that looks at lots of different lengths of rides to estimate your ZFTP. And one of the benefits of this is that it's re-estimated over a 60 to 90 day period. So in theory, it should be relatively accurate, assuming that their algorithm is accurate, to what your FTP actually is at a certain point in time. But even with EFTP and ZFTP, they're based on calculations, based on data that has been used either within the game or within your preferred cycling app. There is no real better way of knowing your functional threshold power than doing an actual FTP test and testing it for real. Okay, let's move on to some racing terminology that's used within cycling and within Zwift. And they are FIN, FAL, FTS, and PBP. So let's take those one at a time. So FIN is finish points. This is the number of points that are awarded for when you cross the finishing line. And normally it is related somewhat to the field that is in the race, so the number of riders that are racing. And for example, if there's 50 riders, then the first person to cross the line would get 50 finish points, and the last person to cross the line would get one finish point. So you can pretty much always get FIN points. FAL points are first across the line, and these are used within segments. So within a race, you'll have segments which are either sprints or climbs, and those segments are timed. So the people that go through those segments first, so you obviously have to be at the front of the peloton to have any chance of getting FAL points, will get points for finishing first across the line in the segment. Um, it varies race to race depending on how many points are available, but quite often it's for around 20 people. So you will get a certain amount of points if you're first across the line and the 20th person across the line would get a different number of points, which would obviously be lower. FTS is also segment based, but slightly different. And this is fastest through segments. So there's no reliance on being at the front of the peloton in order to be able to accumulate FTS points. You just have to be one of the fastest people that went through that segment. So theoretically, you could be in last place, but if you really put the power down to go through the segment, you might get maximum FTS points. Generally speaking, if you're racing as part of a team, you might have a strategy whereabouts you prioritize people that you thought could win the race. So they would go for fin points and probably FAL points because they'd be at the front of the peloton. Certain other people might be unlikely to win the race, but have a good short-term power output and they could potentially pick you up FTS fastest through segment points. 
The final one here is PBP, and that's podium bonus points. And these are usually awarded, even though it says podium, which makes you think of top three, but quite often it's top five. People that finish in the race will get some additional points in order to give them extra credit for having finished so high up in the peloton and not just getting the FIN finish points. So that's the point system, and those are four of the abbreviations that we've just cracked. Let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about VO2, or specifically VO2 max. VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that your body can use during intense exercise. So it's considered to be a key indicator of your cardiovascular fitness. For those of you who are interested, the measurement is milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of weight per minute. That's the formula. And essentially, a higher VO2 max represents a better level of cardiovascular fitness. More specifically, you could say it's actually a measure of cardiorespiratory fitness, because it's all about how well you use the oxygen that your body intakes whilst you are exercising. It's also seen as a health indicator. People with a higher VO2 max have a reduced risk of things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, all of these are correlated with a higher VO2 max, so clearly something that you'd want to work on. How do you improve your VO2 max? Well, it's very simple. You just need to do exercise that gets your heart pumping. This strengthens the heart, improves its ability to move oxygen around the body, and therefore improves your VO2 max. HIT exercises are particularly good for it, but basically any exercise that gets your heart rate up will help improve your VO2 max. You might have come across TSS, which is Training Stress Score. So what does that mean? Essentially, it's a metric of how hard you've trained compared to your current FTP. Again, this is why, as I said before, measuring your FTP is quite crucial for a lot of other metrics, and this one is no exception. In terms of scoring, a 100 TSS score is essentially having achieved one hour at your FTP. So 100 basically maximum. Of course, if you achieve an hour's worth of exercise over your FTP, then your TSS score would reflect that. It's quite often used to measure load and fatigue over time. NP, or normalized power, is a way of taking a power output through a race and then adjusting it and different apps will do it in slightly different ways. But generally speaking, in my experience, they tend to come out broadly similar with the number, but they adjust it with regards to the terrain that you've been riding. So what the calculation does is it tries to give a more accurate power output, regardless of the terrain you've been riding on or how your power output has varied during that particular ride. Most of the time, it would be higher than your average power, especially if you've been on a hilly route or you've been doing interval heavy rides. What I found is normalized power allows me to more accurately compare different rides that I've done in the past, regardless of the terrain they are over, and can be quite useful to see if you are improving in your power output. RPO, or relative power output, is a metric that's quite useful for measuring performance across different riders. It specifically measures your power output to your weight. So this is power by watts per kilogram. And of course, what this does is it takes weight out of the equation effectively and looks at the power versus weight. And then that gives you a comparable figure across lots of different riders, regardless of how much or how little some of you guys weigh. <laughs> WBAL is quite an interesting one. So this is an abbreviation for W prime balance, where the W is a letter used for your anaerobic energy reserve. What does that mean? It's a measure of how much energy you've used and how much energy you have left when you're in a ride. And it recovers during the ride. So as you have harder segments, your W bow will go down. And as you coast, maybe you're going downhill, for example, your W bow can go up as your body recovers. So you'll see this number fluctuate during a race if you have a way of measuring it whilst you're riding. And actually, if you're on Zwift and you have source for Zwift, WBAL is one of the gauges that you can put in your heads-up display uh, so you can monitor it in real time. 
What it does is it helps to identify when you're getting near to exhaustion and maybe when you should try and get some recovery in. So for example, in something like a team time trial, whereabouts you've got six people racing all at the same time. And if you had somebody who was a DS, so essentially watching the race but talking to everybody in real time to try and get the best performance out of everybody, then it might well be that they would have the W bell of every rider and they can see when they're getting fatigued and decide whether or not they should take their pull on the front or whether or not they should rest them. So within racing it can become quite an interesting metric to follow. RPE, or rate of perceived exertion, is a self-classified number, usually between 1 and 10, and it's a subjective scale of how hard you felt a particular exercise was. So quite often you can fill in your RPE into an app, and it's really just how you felt at the end of it. It's more often used whereabouts you don't have power or heart rate data, and you know, you're just trying to put an indicator next to a ride of how tough it felt. TRIMP, or training impulse, is a heart rate based measure of training load. It combines heart rate intensity and duration in order to try and estimate how hard that particular session was on your cardiovascular system. HRRC, or heart rate recovery count, is essentially how quickly your heart gets back down to its normal rate after you've done an exercise session. A faster recovery to your normal resting heart rate is seen as a indicator of better fitness. We've spoken about TRIMP and TSS. TL, or training load, uses both of those metrics to give an indication of the amount of load that you've put on your body over a period of time. So if you are exercising vigorously frequently, then your training load will go up. If you then have a period whereabouts you've not really done any you know, hard efforts or no efforts at all, then your training load will start to decrease. So it's a kind of accumulation, usually using TSS, your training stress score, or TRIMP, which is your training impulse. Most often this seems to be measured over seven to 28 days. It can be particularly useful when you're deciding how hard to push your body and combined with a couple of other metrics, form and fatigue, it gives you an indicator of where your body is and how fresh you are. And um, you know, this is particularly useful if you've got a race coming up and you want to arrive on the start line in the peak possible condition that you can. IF, or intensity factor, measures how intense a workout was compared to your FTP. So it can tell you if you're pacing correctly. For example, a 1.0 IF would be at FTP, 0.75 would probably be around your endurance pace. If you were to look at your IF, your intensity factor, and your TSS, your training stress score together, this is a great couple of metrics that you can combine to see how hard and how long your body was stressed for and that can then be used as a foundation for building training plans. Heart rate zones and power zones we can kind of lump together. Essentially you'd use heart rate zones predominantly if you didn't have power zones for training purposes. Heart rate zones are linked to your maximum heart rate and they can be spread across five segments or seven segments and it allows you to try and pitch your heart rate at a level whereabouts you might want to do a zone two workout for example which is often used to build your basic fitness if you like it's almost like your underlying fitness for harder efforts over a period of time zone two workouts are recommended to do quite frequently uh, in order to build your core fitness on top of which everything else uh, comes. Almost like your foundation fitness, if you like. Power zones are probably slightly more accurate because your heart rate can fluctuate quite a lot and they are based off your FTP. So again, measuring your FTP becomes important because that's exactly what your power zones would be based around. Power zones are the core of structured training within Zwift. So if you do a workout, 
um, the amount of watts that the worker asks you to produce is directly correlated in terms of the effort and linked to your power zones that Zwift will work out from your ZFTP. It's not confusing. Kilojoules is basically a measurement of work done. It's nearly always very similar to kilocalories, you know, amount of energy burnt, basically the amount of energy that you've used when you've been for a ride. CHO might be one that you've come across. It's not that commonly used that I've seen, but basically it's carbohydrate utilization. So it's a measure of the energy that you've used in carbohydrates and not in fat. Some devices will estimate this in grams per hour. So really it's a case of looking whether you're burning fat or you're burning carbohydrates. So that's a bit of a really high level summary of most of the three letter, two letter, four letter abbreviations that you'll come across when you're cycling or in Zwift. If I've missed any and you want to know what they are, let me know in the comments and I can always do a follow up video because there are quite a number of other performance metrics that are available, but this should give you a good basis to get started. Don't forget, I've put chapters in the description, so if you forget them, which I do frequently, you can come back and check them again to see what they mean. And if all of this has got you hungry to do some racing, then perhaps this next video might be of interest.